to say thank you for really an extraordinary overview of where we've been, where we are, where we're going um, for schizophrenia. And um, just as importantly, thank you for all the work that you've done throughout your career um, to improve the lives of people um, with this illness. Uh, I want to start, we, um, uh, we received, uh, first of all, a number of compliments for your presentation, um, and a number of, of questions about a variety of the approaches that you spoke about. Um, and one was related to cognitive remediation. And I'd like to ask if you could say a little bit more about how that works and who should get it. So, uh, and of course, this is where someone who really does this, an expert, will give you a better response than I will. But the, the idea is that you identify areas of cognition impairment. You think about tasks and practices that would be relevant to that area. It's almost like a view of exercising your brain in ways that have a relationship to the cognition impairments and see if that practice can actually improve your cognitive performance. And if it does, does that improve other aspects of your illness or your functioning? So you could have uh, computer games uh, that would be cognitively enhancing, uh, hypothetically cognitively enhancing. Uh, those could be delivered sometimes with uh, someone in supervision, sometimes uh, just off computer screens that you learn to do. Um, they would be a little bit, some of them, like the luminosity or things that are, are more publicly available that they try to interest all of us in doing for our brain health. The studies so far generally suggest a, a modest improvement, but it's not clear how much difference that makes in the person's life. And it's also not clear yet how how specific the exercise needs to be in relationship to the impairment. Uh, there was one study, for example, that compared to a, a one control condition, the people improved with the cognitive remediation, but another control condition involved playing computer games that were not designed for the cognition part for the same amount of time. Uh, both those improved the functioning on the cognition measure. Good. Um, very, very helpful answer. Um, a couple of people asked um, about the use of choline during pregnancy and the work that Dr. Friedman and, and his team in Colorado are doing. At this point in time, is it recommended that a pregnant woman take choline, especially if there is a family history of schizophrenia? So that, that this would be very much still at the hypothetical phase. Um, we don't know, for example, if maturing the P50 phenotype um, actually reduces the incidence of any mental disorder. Um, the work by the Colorado group was interesting because of how it illustrates the need to have some early markers that we can measure change in that might have a predictive later relationship to reducing incidents in the long term, but we simply don't have that kind of information yet. So I think at this at this stage, and I'm no expert in this, but I think a decision about a choline supplement or, or the precursor that you supplement with would be something that that uh, a pregnant woman would consider with her obstetrician with an hypothesis, but no solid data as to what difference it will actually make at the individual level or in the long term for the offspring. It does illustrate that there are many risk factors that we know of that could be actionable that would be hypothesized to have an important public health benefit. And our field has not been able to move forward with them. Um, the, the problems are easy to see because if it's done very early in life, it's hard to have a, a massive study that you have to wait 30 years to find out if you actually decrease the incidence of a disorder. And we don't know what the early valid markers are 
for making a judgment that you're actually having a primary prevention effect. So there's the fundamental work is not done. But when you think about the many risk factors that go all the way from, from cannabis use in adolescence to bullying, earlier adolescence to childhood neglect or trauma, um, they're, they're just a host of known risk factors for psychotic illness that could be amenable to change and reduction of incidence of illness, but these just have not been worked out yet. The, I, I think that you, you, you're bringing up an important point um, in terms of early intervention beyond the prevention that perhaps choline may prove to to result in, that if a, if a parent sees in, in their teenage child or even college age young, young adult child um, changes in their behavior that, that they're concerned about, they, should, they shouldn't just leave it be. They should seek uh, professional help um, because the earlier the intervention, ultimately the better results for the person. Uh, yes, and, and I, I would even make the statement a bit broader. So if, if, you're, if you have a, a child, young adolescent, that is distressed by problems that are beginning to be manifest, they merit clinical attention. Even if the vast majority of them would never develop a psychotic illness, they are still developing illness that might turn out to be an anxiety disorder, depressive disorder, a personality disorder, but uh, illness manifestations that will interfere with function, interfere with their life, and it merits clinical attention. If they're actually on the path to psychosis, and this either prevents the full progression to it or enables them to get treatment for it at an earlier stage, then those are very substantial potential benefits. But the need for this evaluation, clinicians will soon have better information. Uh, there are predictor calculators that are being worked out where the type of information that can be obtained clinically uh, can lead to an estimate about how much is there actually a risk for developing a psychotic illness. But in any case, clinical treatment is warranted. The, one of the challenges that families often have is that a, a part of the illness often can bring about paranoia about the family, um, could uh, bring about a, a desire on the part of the person with the illness not to have treatment. And um, that's a challenge for family members because of the HIPAA regulations and confidentiality, et cetera. What do you recommend to families who are in a situation where their loved one doesn't want treatment, um, doesn't uh, want the family involved, et cetera? How does a family help the person that they care about and love so much? So, boy, I mean, Jeff, this is uh, so often a very, very difficult situation and very hard for us from a clinical perspective to know how to advise them to intervene. And obviously, it's going to vary a good deal from situation to situation. And it varies with how the extent that it is unmanageable. So if, if the paranoia uh, is leading to anger and to aggression and to danger. It, it leads you down one path. If it leads to just kind of retreating from family and social interactions, another. So this is another situation that has to be evaluated very much on the individual circumstances. And what clinicians are armed with is a way to kind of think through with families and think about practical approaches, but nobody is going to have kind of an evidence-based approach that's been demonstrated to generalize across these situations and to be effective. Um, I, I think we often find ourselves just struggling with the family members on how best to deal with the individual situation. Uh, the HIPAA and, and other ethical requirements uh, we are very often talking about someone who's a young adult. They may 
not have insight into the illness. They may be angry. They may be paranoid, accusatory, and they can order their clinician not to speak to their parents or not to inform. So it gets very, very complicated and very sad in a lot of circumstances. I wish I had something a good deal more useful to say on this. I think you're you're right on target in what you're describing. I think an important thing for families to be aware of is that even if the psychiatrist or other clinical members of the team helping uh, their loved one it doesn't have permission to speak to the family, uh, in an emergency situation, um, those HIPAA laws are um, loosened so that they could get information that is helpful to the the patient. Um, and certainly even without that, families can leave a message for the clinician um, so at least they can get information from the family even if the clinician isn't speaking directly with them. Uh, and that could sometimes be helpful. Um, if I want to add one, one comment that may be somewhat related, um, particularly in the United States, long-acting injectable antipsychotic drugs have been underutilized and have been treated as though they're stigmatizing. Uh, there is the concern if someone starts treatment adhering to the medication, which can help prevent exacerbation and relapses as well as help controlling resistant symptoms, that adherence is very, very uneven. And people should be more open to the possibility of using long-acting injectables to try to assure longer-lasting aspects to the therapeutic management that relates to the drugs. And this is one place. The second thing is that uh, if patients are just not going to take drugs, they might well engage with the clinician in an agreement on circumstances in which they would be willing to go back on medication for brief periods. And there was, this is from maybe 30 years ago, a good deal of evidence that targeted drug treatment, while not quite as effective at preventing relapses as if people would continue to take medication, that it was an effective intervention, particularly if the intervention came early in an exacerbation. And I think those are two underutilized approaches for people who, where the medication adherence leads to a problem. I think those are two very good points. Um, I, we could probably go on for uh, an extended period of time, but unfortunately, our time is up for today. And I want to, again, Will, thank you for your presentation and for all the work that you've done um, to help better the lives of people with schizophrenia. It certainly has had an impact and continues to have an impact. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks very much for those nice words. And of course, it, it's just been a privilege to be in this field. And it, uh, uh, I love what we're able to do in research. I love what can be done clinically and just are so hopeful that we make further progress in the near future. Yeah, well, your your work and your words are certainly reasons for tremendous hope on the part of all of us. So thank you. I, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. All of the research that the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds is made possible through private donations. So please consider making a contribution by visiting our webpage, bbrfoundation.org, or call us at 800-829-8289. The webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or friend, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Sarah Feinberg, an instructor at the Yale Department of Psychiatry, will present Quantifying Difficulties in Social Interaction in Borderline Personality Disorder. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, March 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.